you uh, today. So um, what I want to talk about, and you can see the, the title of my presentation, is security is already here, it's just unevenly distributed. And I get asked all the time by people, you know, is security getting worse? Is it getting, is it getting better? And I always have to say it's mixed, right? It seems like some things are getting better and some things are j just staying bad. Right? And we see improvements in some places with security, like people using cloud infrastructure the right way, or some of the operating systems out there. Really nice, uh, solid foundation, and you can tell they're, 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 they're helping. But in general, uh, I see most products and services out there causing, causing security problems. So uh, one of my favorite books is Neuromancer uh, by William Gibson. And uh, was was sort of the seminal cyberpunk book, and it was influential to me in the 20s. And so I follow William Gibson on Twitter, and I listen to what he has to say. And uh, he has this quote: "The future is already here; it's just unevenly distributed." And you think, if you think about it, that's true, right? The future starts somewhere, and then eventually, most places catch up, catch up to that. Um, and I thought, you know. If we could do that with security, that would be good. If we could find the places where people are doing a good job securing their systems and eliminating vulnerabilities, and then everyone caught up to that, that, that would be a good way to think about it. Because um, otherwise, we just, we're just going to have the same problems we always have. Uh, so I just want to talk a little bit about my background that kind of leads me to, to here. Um, I was part of this group loft, as Dylan said, in the 90s, and uh, I was a vulnerability researcher, independent vulnerability researcher. And uh, back then we just called ourselves hackers because there wasn't a term for it. We weren't you know, breaking, breaking any laws. Um, we might have been doing things that companies didn't like us to do, which was basically finding holes in their products. Now that's a standard thing. It's not a big deal, right? It's, it's part of the process. But back then, it was, it was, no, it was notable that there was a group of, of people finding holes in Veracode products. Not Veracode products, that's my, my company now. Uh, other, other vendors' products. Like Microsoft, and we got the we got the attention of the the U.S. Senate, and they asked us to come and and talk to them. We were the first hackers to come in in a positive light um, and talk to the Senate uh, about what we thought should be done to improve U.S. government security and just security um, overall. And if you don't, you can't tell who I am in the picture. That's me. Um, the hair's changed a little bit. It's been, it's been a long time. But the other thing that's interesting about this is they let us, they let us uh, use our hacker names. Like it says Weld Pond there and Mudge and Space Rogue. Um, uh, senator Thompson, who was the, uh, the lead senator, uh, his son said, what did you do today? He says, you know, it was really strange. I was, uh, I was at a hearing and I was asking questions of a guy called Space Rogue. <laughs> so, uh, you know, ha hacker names can add, add a little bit of levity to... Uh, to any, any kind of situation. But the, the thing that I'm really proud of that we did at, at the loft was we really changed the mindset of a lot of people that were building software products and building hardware products. And that mindset change was adversarial testing. Uh, and we, you know, we basically called it improve the security of your product by breaking into it. So up until that time period, you know, vendors thought they were doing all the right things to secure their products. They were putting in authentication and authorization, and um, but they didn't know anything about writing their code securely, writing their code so it didn't have buffer overflows. And what we did, we said, hey, you know what? You should use hacker techniques, right? You should you know, do penetration testing, fuzzing, um, looking, looking through the code if you had source code, looking through the binary if you didn't, to find the problems and act like a hacker. And if you did that, and you were the person making the product, you would actually ship a much more secure product. And that was the big change that we pushed forward um, when we uh, went over to the you know, you might say the legitimate side or the for pay side um, when we started a company called At Stake. And I got the privilege of working with a lot of great people um, at stake and we really pushed this notion that software vendors should adopt hacker techniques to make their software secure 
Um, Katie Masuris, who's here in the audience, was one of my colleagues from, from At Stake. I got to work with the Loft uh, guys and people like Alex Stamos, who was the CISO of Facebook um, and uh, Yahoo before that. It was just a lot of people uh, at, at At Stake at the time who took these techniques and made them something that could be delivered as professional services and we could teach software vendors uh, how, to, how, to, how to do this. And I think we made a significant uh, change there. But again, that's not evenly distributed. We really started off with Microsoft and eBay and some of the leading software providers. Uh, but that wasn't nearly evenly distributed. Even though those leaders were, were doing those techniques to make their software secure, there's still people today that don't do anything as they're building software to try to make their their product secure. And the scary thing is they're doing things like making crypto wallets and, and all, all kinds of things, making mobile apps that track, that have your personal data in them. So after At Stake, I was there, we, At Stake got bought by Symantec, um, was looking for something else to do, and me and my colleague from the loft, Dildog, who was also at At Stake, um, also known as Christian Ryu, we, we wanted to automate the things that we did at at uh, at stake. So at stake was consulting. We used some tools, but it was mostly a manual process. We actually did code review by reading the code, and we wanted to automate that because if we didn't, then we couldn't distribute our knowledge and distribute the capability. It would just be the small amount of experts working for the small amount of big software companies, and the average person writing code wouldn't get the benefit of being able to secure their code. So one of the things we did to help distribute our knowledge much broader is to make make it into tools and, and automate it and provide an automated service. And that was the idea behind Vericode. And I, I still feel we're only like 10% penetrated into the market, right? There's still a long way to go. And we've been around for 13 years. It's slow to get people to adopt um, these new techniques like building security in. So now I want to talk a little bit about where I see some of the problems that we have today um, that are causing problems for, for everyone. So internet infrastructure is still broken. The stuff that was decided in the late 80s um, and early 90s, um, things like the Border Gateway Protocol, BGP, uh, the way DNS works, um, the way uh, certificates are used for encryption and authentication. These systems all have problems, and these are relied on by everyone. So if we were able to fix these systems, that would help, that would help everyone out. Um, people today that know about these problems can build their software to try to design around all these problems, but that's extra work. Right, and um, I'll give you an example of uh, of that is um, BGP, which is the Border Gateway Protocol, which is how the different networks of the internet connect to each other. Um, so how a corporate network could could connect to through an ISP to the backbone of the uh, back, backbone of the internet. And there's this problem with BGP called BGP spoofing, where you send a BGP message out to a router, and you tell that router to route traffic in a way that routes it through your network, as opposed to the way it, it should go. We talked about this back in 1998 when we testified at the Senate. The famous line out of that, uh, that out, of, out of our hearing, sort of the sound bite, was they said they could take down the internet in 30 minutes. So you can see how that would kind of raise everyone's uh, uh, awareness and say, whoa, what are these guys doing? But it was, it was a fact, right? With BGP spoofing, you could disrupt the internet by try, say, sending everyone's network traffic through you know, one network provider, like send it all through AT&T, one, one router, like route it all through there. And that would essentially couldn't handle the load and traffic wouldn't be, wouldn't be routed. Um, after we testified, um, the Internet, uh, Internet Engineering Task Force, which comes up with these protocol improvements, came up with secure BGP back in like 99 or 2000, and then no one implemented it. No one's implemented it. So it, do it doesn't exist anywhere today. The problem that's been around for a long time, um, I have a, uh, you know, a, a tweet up here. I, I follow this uh, Twitter account called BGP Stream. 
And BGP stream, uh, whenever there's a, uh, a, 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 a strange looking BGP hijack or change, they, it tweets it out. And this is an example of uh, the U.S. Department of Energy's network being routed through China Telecom. Uh, that, that's obviously uh, some malfeasance there. That's, that, that's probably not the, the correct route. It could be a mistake, but it looks pretty suspicious to me. Um, and so that's still happening today. There was an attack um, last year on my Ether wallet. So my Ether wallet is a place you can store your Ethereum uh, crypto. And uh, someone did a pretty sophisticated attack uh, by rerouting BGP. So they, uh, my Ether wallet, um, their server, their DNS server was on a network uh, run. Um, the, the network was run by uh, Amazon's Route 53 service, which is a DNS service. They hijacked that network, rerouted the traffic to their DNS server, which then rerouted uh, to a, 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 a fake uh, myetherwallet.com server. And so everyone who was doing any kind of ether transfer would log into their wallet there, give their credentials, and they would quickly suck all the the, the ether out of people's wallets. These BGP attacks don't really last that long because someone notices it. You can see this BGP stream Twitter account is noticing it. This lasted for two hours before it was corrected. In two hours, they stole $17 million. So it just shows you in a small windows of time, if you plan your attack, you can do some ser serious, serious damage. And so the way that the internet deals with this right now is there's these network operators groups. There's one called Nanog in North America. They notice these things and they get on the phone and they say, hey, this looks, this looks strange, Department of Energy. You might want to contact China Telecom and tell them that this is wrong. And that takes a little bit of time. That's not really a good secure mechanism if someone can, you know, compromise a lot of systems, take control in just an hour or two. Um, so that's a good example of something that's broken. And until we fix it, it's just always going to be there affecting everyone. Um, DNS is another, another good example. It's this sort of single point of failure that um, there was a report that just came out recently that, you know, the, the, the uh, finance companies are getting hit. And a lot of this is just denial of service. You do a denial of service against their DNS servers, and then then they you know no one can reach reach their site. Of course, there's you know taking over someone's domains is another uh, another thing that people do. There's cash poisoning. You know the DNS system is just sort of riddled with all these problems, and it it mostly works. But this is another example of something that you know people individuals can't fix. We need to we need to fix these at a systemic level. But I don't really see much motion to do these. Right? It seems like we're just going to live with BGP problems, DNS problems, certificate problems, for, for forever. And uh, you know, I don't think that's necessarily a good thing. Um, another problem I see is, you know, security vendors tell their customers that their technology will make them secure, right? Um, does anyone in this room know how to pick locks? So you can you show some hands, pick locks? So we got some people who can pick locks. One of the things that I love about these lock picking villages, and we teach all our employees how to pick locks at Veracode, um, is it really wakes you up to the fact that the lock actually gives very, very little security. Sure, it gives some security. It takes some time to pick the lock. Someone might be caught while they're picking the lock, but it's just a little bit of security. They, you know, your, your average everyday lock can be picked in seconds, right? And I think the average person doesn't know that. They think you need to be James Bond to pick a lock. You need to be this super secret agent with special tools. And really, the tools are available for ten dollars, and anyone can learn to do it in about fifteen minutes. Um, so I, I think we have the same problem with security products. Right? Yeah, they give you a little bit of security, but we've, we've diluted everyone. The average, you know, small business owner, the average person who, who maybe has a firewall and has an antivirus, we've diluted them into thinking that, you know, they're secure now. Where really we, they've raised the bar just a tiny, tiny bit because attackers know how to bypass all that stuff. Just like people know how to pick locks. And, um, so they don't do anything more to secure themselves. They just, they buy a couple of products and they and they think they're secure. So I think that's completely broken. I think the sort of the the contract that vendors have with their customers is is very broken. They all say that they're the the best product and 
install us and you'll be secure. And it's just, it's completely, completely not true. And we need to make people aware of that, right? The security vendors aren't gonna, aren't gonna do that. Um, the, the other big problem I see out there is people think it's secure by default. Right? They think, you know, it came in a shiny box. It's got a nice brand name to it. Um, it must be secure. So I bought this nice, you know, uh, I bought this nice doorbell camera or, um, I installed this, this mobile app from a brand I recognize, a hotel chain or something like that. And they just assume that because they have a brand, because it's a new product, it must be secure. And that's absolutely, that's absolutely not, not true. It's about as secure as the HASP lock that uh, that I'm showing in this picture, which has a lot of problems, right? One of them is it doesn't have a locking mechanism on it, but if it didn't, it wouldn't be secure either, right, if you had a screwdriver. Um, so so the idea is people just assume they that things are secure and then they're done, right? They don't have to do that. And that keeps fostering the, the situation where people don't push back against the vendors and say, you know, what did you do to make this product secure? Right? Like, why, why should I trust that? Like, you're, you're telling me I can install this to get this functionality, this great capability, and make my life easier. But it's not going to make my life easier if all my data gets stolen, especially if you're a small business or a medium or large business, right? It's going to be very expensive um, for you when that happens. And that can happen just by installing one bad uh, IoT device, uh, one bad piece of software. So this notion that things are just people are doing the right thing and we don't have to challenge them is just completely, completely wrong. Um, and software developers, uh, until they're educated, will not change. They just think that they're writing, uh, they're good software developers, they write good quality code, good functional code, they get their stuff done on time, they don't have, they don't have quality bugs on making secure software. And that's just untrue, right? You actually have to test for security problems or you're not making secure software. Back in, um, this was like when I was at stake in, I think it was around 2002, 2003, we went to the Java 1 conference, which is the conference where all the Java developers go to learn about the new capabilities of Java, new Java tools and things like that. And at stake set up a stand there with a tool and a service that we would test your Java programs for you and, you know, tell you if they were secure or not and tell you how to, how to fix them. And developers would come up and they would just laugh at us. They would say, there's no need for your service because Java is secure. Just using Java is secure because the creators of Java at Sun, they basically marketed their language as a secure language. Write your code. Don't write your code in C or, or, or these older languages. Write them in Java and your program will be secure. And that was the farthest thing from the truth, right? I mean, I, I, today at Veracode, uh, I have thousands of applications our customers have sent us written in Java that have gaping vulnerabilities like SQL injection and command injection. Um, and so there's, a, there's this, this, this notion that things are secure by default and some bad thing happens to make it insecure is the opposite, right? You have to do, take action to make things secure and we need to educate people. The other, uh, we have the saying, um, or I'm not sure where the saying came from, but the cobbler's children have no shoes. Has anyone heard that saying? Yeah. You know, the shoemaker's children have no shoes. And the, the idea is the shoemaker is so busy um, sec um, making shoes to sell to their customers and they're, they, they're too tired or they don't have time to make shoes, e shoes even for their own children. And that's actually the case with security companies, right? I, we, we've looked at the data and security companies are actually the worst at writing secure software. It, it seems crazy, right? If you're writing a firewall, wouldn't you want to make sure it's secure? Or you're, you're, you're writing an IDS product, you, don't, you, you want to make sure that IDS is detecting problems, not creating problems. But uh, what we did a, we did a, uh, we did a uh, analysis of all the software that we looked at at Veracode um, over a year period. And we broke it down by the type of product it was. And it actually turned out that the best products were uh, 
This is really dim, but hopefully you can see it. The best products were financial products where only 37% failed our test, and here failing was having a, having a high severity or critical vulnerability. Um, only 37% failed the test, which shows that, you know, people writing software that does financial transactions are actually caring about security, right? But if you look at the top, security products failed 74% of the time. So even though financial services people are, are making their products secure, security products companies are not doing that. Their products are shipping with more vulnerabilities, uh, more needing to be patched than any other product category. So that's pretty shocking if you think about it, right? And um, that, so that's the data we saw sort of in the vulnerabilities out there. Um, and then um, my colleague from the loft, Mudge, tweeted uh, that he had some data from the Department of Defense, the US government, that even though security software was only 3.8% of the software deployed in the Department of Defense and the US government environment, 28% of all the vulnerabilities in their infrastructure were coming from security products. That's pretty crazy, right? That's a lot of risk, and it's a lot of patching, right? 28% of your patching just coming from your security products. So this is another case where we're assuming they, they're doing the right thing, we're assuming it's secure by default, and unless we push back on these companies, they're gonna keep sending vulnerabilities to us, even as we use their software to try to secure our environments. So that's sort of where we're now, and of course where we're heading could be potentially worse, right? Technology is changing at such a rapid pace that it's hard for us to adapt. It's hard to us as businesses, as people to adapt. It's almost like there's a steady stream of new technology coming at us constantly. You know, IoT and robotics and AI, this stuff is just moving so quickly. We can't even secure what we have now. That sounds like we're headed for a bigger problem. So up until now, I've been talking about the vulnerability space, and this is a quote from someone um, I'll, I'll say in, show in a minute. But on the threat space side, this person said, we'll live in a world of ceaseless and pervasive cyber insecurity and cyber conflict against nation states, businesses, and individuals. So ceaseless and pervasive sounds bad. Right, and I think that's that's that that is where we are, and 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 where 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 we're going to stay as far as the 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 threat space goes. And this was uh, an op-ed in the New York Times by the general counsel of the NSA. Um, so probably knows something about the vulnerability space and something about uh, the threat space. So you know. Uh, they say a sign of um, insanity is to keep doing the same things over and over again and, and expecting it to change. So we have to change what we're doing, right? We have to change this up or things are just going to continue to get worse. We got our technology moving faster, more dependent on technology, and we got ceaseless attacks, right? So now I want to talk about well, first I want to talk about one more thing where, where, where things are, which I think makes a difference. And this is one of the things that's allowing this quick technological change, is everything is getting to be software defined. Uh, Mark Andreessen famously said, software is eating the world. Um, specifically, software uh, is eating infrastructure. So when software eats infrastructure and infrastructure became software defined, it just can change at a much more rapid pace. You don't have people like putting special purpose hardware in racks and plugging them in um, and you know changing, changing hardware configurations. They're using general purpose hardware and they're layering all kinds of software on there to do the things the hardware used to do like, um, like like be, be a firewall, or firewalls used to be a piece of hardware. Now a firewall is just a program running on a general purpose uh, software. So when software eats infrastructure, it makes it really simple for people to go fast, and businesses can go fast and deploy new services. And that's why the cloud is taking off, is because it allows, it's not for cost savings. Yes, you do get some cost savings about maintaining your infrastructure, your own data center, but it's really about competitiveness and how your company can outcompete the competition because you can move, you can move so quickly. And there's this whole DevOps movement, which we're taking operations people who used to manage hardware, and they're becoming part of the development team and deploying and managing 
the, the, the systems that runs the software is just becoming software defined. And this is just accelerating um, the rate of change. And you know, if you think about it from a security point of view, um, where's security in this equation? Right? We're able to deploy systems, change systems really rapidly in hours. And how do we make sure that's secure? So the movement that I see that has to happen is not just take operations and move it into development, but take security and move it into that team too. So security is part of that process. And ultimately, security gets eaten by software and security becomes software, right? And when I say that, it's really two things. Developers are the ones who are doing security, not the security team. So developers are running security tools, building security tools for themselves, understanding how to use those as they're developing the software. And security people, in order to secure their organizations, are writing software. They're not necessarily pulling products off the shelf and just configuring them they're actually writing software that is getting injected into the software infrastructure of their enterprise. And that's, so I think that's the thing, trend we're gonna see and we want it, and I think it has to be that way. I think software security has to be thought of as a software process now and part of the ecosystem that's all becoming software defined. So what are some of the other things we can we can do and you know I, the contrast here is on one side we have leaky buckets leaky s3 buckets leaking you know the data of every citizen in ecuador was leaked uh, about a, about a month ago millions of people's data because someone just misconfigured uh, what they call an s3 bucket which is a uh, file storage on on amazon's cloud um, network. Um, that's just going to continue happening unless something changes. Um, the, the top news item here, uh, D-Link agrees to make security enhancements. Um, D-Link just basically makes, makes routers and they just have been making routers for years and not, not building them securely and not patching them even when they know they're insecure. So, uh, you know, we just can't let that be the standard, right? If that's, if that's the standard going forward, that's what the average company's doing, we're not gonna get any better. But there are companies doing good things, right? If you look at iOS, Windows 10, Google's Chrome, these teams are actually making secure software. They're doing all the right processes to make secure software. And think about it, if they weren't, we would be in a lot worse shape we are because almost everyone relies on, on, on this technology. But this is where I talk about it's unevenly distributed, right? We have some people doing a good job and we have some people doing a horrible job. So how can we, how can we change that situation? So that's a situation I, I want to change and I want, I want everyone to think about. Um, that's, that's how we, 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 we move forward and, and get better. So there was this uh, quote by uh, John F. Kennedy. He, uh, he, he, he took it from someone else, but he's, he's pretty famous being the U.S. president. And he said when he was talking about his economic policy, he was saying a rising tide lifts all boats. So basically economic growth um, helps the people at the top, it helps the rich, it helps the middle class, it helps the poor get out of the poverty line. Maybe they didn't have a job and they can have a job. So you could think about economic policy that is like a rising tide lifting all boats. It's not just helping, helping the wealthy, it's helping the whole country. It's helping all the citizens of the country. So I thought about this and I, you know, I applied it to security. You know, we could take our, 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 uh, security expertise and effort and help iOS and Windows and Chrome get a little bit more secure. That would, that would help a little bit, right? Um, but that would just be helping sort of the security rich, right? It wouldn't be helping the security middle class and then people have called, you know, you're below the security poverty line if you don't have any. And that's sort of the D-links and the, 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 the leaky S3 buckets of the, of the world. Just, if, if just the, these, these critical pieces of software get a little bit more secure, it's really not going to help us because we're going to install one IoT device, we're going to download one application, one plugin, and it's going to compromise us, right? So I want to think of things that will lift all the boats, right? Not just 
make the things better. And we, we get into a lot of this in the security profession um, where everyone is really interested in the, in the new super, super awesome uh, you know, exploit that you know, escapes a sandbox or something that's really, really hard to do in Windows 10. And we give that, we, we, we pay $100,000 bug bounties for that. And that's, that's fine. But I think the real problem is, is, is elsewhere is elsewhere. It's not making the leaders a little bit richer. It's, it's, it's bringing more of these people in security pro poverty um, in, into the middle class. So I want to go through some things that are going to lift all the boats, things, things that I think will, will lift all the boats. I already talked about you know, the problems with BGP and DNS and, um, and certificates. You know, I, I think fixing that internet infrastructure is an obvious one that helps everything. Like my Ether wallet, it's hard for them to defend against an attack like that where, where their DNS router gets, um, they can defend against it, but um, it, it, it makes their life more, more difficult. So I want to think th about things that can be applied broadly um, to everyone. So we can look at what those security leaders are doing and emulate what, what they're doing, right? And if the security leaders publish what they're doing, that helps everybody, right? So one thing is they assume the network is compromised. So they assume no trust of not only the internet, but of their own internal network. They don't have an internal network because they just assume all networking between a client and a server, between a user and a service or an app, um, is, is untrusted. And Google did this um, a few years ago, and they came out with a lot of documentation. They called it Beyond Corp. And the concept is, is zero trust. There's no trust of, of the network. And Google, Google did this because um, about, uh, I think it was about 10 years ago, there was the Aurora attacks. Um, and Google's infrastructure, their, their, their Gmail, was, was compromised through their China office. And the, by, by trusting the network on, the, on their China office, um, that led to someone being able to, to, to compromise systems there um, and be able to get to the whole Google network. And that's a problem that a lot of enterprises have, right? One weak link, someone, someone compromises an endpoint somewhere, and all of a sudden everything, every, every, everything that trusted that device because it was on the network um, is, 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 uh, can, can get to other assets on the network. And so this zero trust concept um, is something that Google has done. They spent a lot of time researching the best way to do it, and they published, they published how they did it. And there's other companies that have published things about this. So any enterprise can, can learn from, from what they did to protect themselves and, and build that. And I think well, all organizations should move to a, a zero trust model. You know, if you're building a company from scratch, you just start off at zero trust. If you, with, if you're a, uh, a company that's many years old, it's going to take you years to do this. It took years for Google to do it. But you head in that direction and you'll end up with a more secure, um, secure network. And the, the good thing about it is once you get there, you don't need VPNs, you don't need firewalls, uh, you don't need other network security devices because you're just assuming that, you know, the network is, is compromised. The security moves to the, the endpoints. Um, the other thing that the security leaders do is they build security in as they're building their software and they expect their suppliers to. They, when they purchase uh, a, a software asset or service, their acquisition policy says, hey, we have to make sure that they built that securely, or if they're running a SaaS service for us, that they're operating securely. That's what security leaders do. If everyone did that, if everyone just had that as a policy, then then uh, I, 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 that would push back on the vendors, and we wouldn't see security products, for one thing, being the, the worst, uh, the worst uh, offenders with vulnerabilities. And the other thing you do is you can leverage, leverage the work of others, right? Instead of doing it yourself, you know, if someone else provides, provides the software or service, license it, license it from them. An example of this is, uh, Microsoft. Microsoft is actually going to be using the, the Chrome engine in their, um, in their, in their browser that they're going to build into, um, you know, Windows 10. They just said, hey, you know, Google has actually done a better job 
of, of writing a secure browser. And instead of us trying to do it, why don't we, why don't we just use, we'll license, license their browser. So leveraging the work of others instead of trying to do it yourself is, is something that other security leaders do. And we see this in, even in financial services where they build upon things like AWS, which has taken a lot of effort, and Azure has taken a lot of effort to build a secure infrastructure as opposed to maintain their, trying to maintain their own secure infrastructure. The other thing I think everyone can do um, is, uh, is operate less software, right? So software is problematic to operate because you have to install it correctly, you have to configure it correctly, you have to maintain it to be patched. Um, if, if something gets injected in there, if malware gets into your software, you have to detect that, you have to get it out of there and fix it. Um, so operating software is, takes work, to, make, to keep it secure, if someone else who's better at operating software is able to do all those things for you, that's better. So if you're a small or medium-sized business, you probably don't want to operate your own software. So use, use a SaaS model, right? Use software as a service. And a good example of this is, um, even though Microsoft does a good job making Exchange relatively secure, it's still better if Microsoft operates that Exchange server than you do because they're really good at configuring that and maintaining and, and, and monitoring it that, it that it's secure, much better than you are. And this is why people are moving to things like uh, Office 365 for, for their email. Same thing with people moving to G Suite and, and Gmail instead of operating their own SendMail server, right? Because you get people that all they do is operate that kind of software. They're going to do. They're going to do a better job at it. And I think across the board, um, moving to more of a SaaS-based world uh, is 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 better. Now, um, when you move to a SaaS-based world, it isn't secure by default, right? Like there's lots of SaaS providers that that might not be doing good security. So you still have to hold them accountable. You still have to make sure your SaaS provider is doing the right thing. So I say here, look for DIE and good crypto. So you look for your SaaS provider to actually build a, build a good, a good uh, cloud uh, infrastructure with a uh, distributed ar architecture uh, is the D. Um, so you, you have many systems uh, working together uh, in parallel for reliability. Um, immutable, the I is immutable so that that infrastructure, once it's deployed, can't be changed by attackers, the code can't be changed. And ephemeral is the E, where systems come up, they do some work, and they, and they shut down. Um, and then uh, some more work has to be happened, another system spins up, does that work. That ephemeralness makes it that, a, that an attacker can't insert malware, gain control, and persist. It makes it much more different, difficult. So if SaaS providers are using these nice cloud uh, way of of building infrastructure, they they have these properties that can make for a more much more secure system than you just running, you know, software sitting on one server or a few servers in your data center. It's it's a world of difference, and I think everyone can be better, but you still have to hold your vendors accountable that they're actually building their system securely and they're actually using good good crypto and good good key management too. So those are all questions to ask them. As far as industry and, and government groups, I still think we need some basic regulation out there. I would love it if the, the marketplace would do this. You know, I'm a, a capitalist by heart. I'm an entrepreneur. I started a, a company. I don't want to be restricted in what I can do. But if the market can't solve this problem, then I think the government needs to. And so this has been happening in the UK with their secure uh, by uh, design uh, effort where for IoT devices, they're saying it just needs some basic standards of security in order to be sold in the UK. Some really basic things, like it can't have hard-coded passwords built into the device. Uh, the device has to be um, securely updatable. So it's crazy to think about an IoT device that can't be securely updatable, but they're everywhere. So it has to be able to be updatable and securely, right? So it, it has to use uh, cryptography to, to have signed updates. And uh, you need a, um, a vendor um, response process. If someone finds a vulnerability, you have to show that you have 
a contact address that someone can, can, can disclose a vulnerability to you, you will coordinate with them and you will, uh, and you'll fix and update your software. I don't think that's a lot to ask, right? That's a minimum standard, but it would actually make a big difference because there's products out there that don't even do um, these basic things. So that would that would be something that would lift lift all boats. Um, transparency, I think, is is important. So what does a pro what did a, what were the processes that went into building building a product, right? What 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 crypto algorithms does it do? What open source components are in that product? Um, there's some movement in the U.S. Department of Commerce to standardize on a software bill of materials so that when you, someone ships you a piece of software, they also tell you what open source they used and what versions are in there because we all know over time new vulnerabilities are made public in open source software and this way maybe you could take action or if the vendor is having to disclose this, you'll know that they have a vulnerability when, when that's out there and you can put put pressure on them. So that's that's transparency, sort of labeling um, of the software. And, and another case, and this, this one really came to light recently, we've always had the problem of these products that have what we call forever vulnerabilities, because what happens is the, uh, the vendor end of life's a piece of hardware, and they say, I'm not going to update it anymore, right? And this has recently happened with D-Link D-Link routers, um, there was a critical uh, CVSS-10, so the highest criticality vulnerability was found in a D-Link router, and uh, D-Link said, oh, we're not going to fix it, uh, we end of life those, those products. The problem with that is, is how do the people who have deployed those routers know this? How do they know they need to upgrade their hardware? Did they even think about, at some point in time, I'm going to have to upgrade my hardware? The thing that's even worse is those routers are still for sale. When that vulnerability came out, I looked on Amazon and um, some other sites, and you can still buy the vulnerable routers today that will never get the patch. So you can buy a router, pay full price for a new router, it has a critical vulnerability in it that will never be patched. That's just that's just a broken marketplace. That 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 that's that's that doesn't really work. So, I think you know a transparency method would be, you know, an expiration date on your hardware. So if you're going to end of life that hardware and not patch it anymore, put an expiration date on it, so that after you know after five years you're going to have to buy a new router, and then that could be part of the purchase decision or part of the planning decision. Um, for people buying buying software, so I think we just we need some standards, minimum standards, and some some transparency, or we're going to stay with the same problems we have. Um, and then finally, you know, I'm speaking to you as as, as security professionals here. Um, I think we have a duty to educate the business leaders in our organizations or any kind of business groups we're part of. So some of the things I talked about you know, need to be more widely known by people whose businesses are relying on this technology. You know, so we have to tell them, like, you know, we, we can't trust the Internet infrastructure. We either need to be a force lobbying for those to be improved or we've got to take all this effort to, to secure around all these problems that are inherent in the infrastructure. You know, the people that were, um, you know, the founders and the, and the, and the, and the leaders of my Ether wallet should, should, should have known this. Um, we need to change the notion around the way business leaders think about, you know, security products, right? That's, it's not, there's no silver bullets or even a set of 10 bullets that are going to solve the problems. You can't solve this with just installing more um, security products. You got to think about the way you deal with buying technology from from someone else, right? You have to think about your supply chain. You have to think about pushing back and demanding more information from vendors before the, you'll give them your money, even if it is a security product. And we really can't we can't we can't rely on them alone. Um, and then I think this is a really important one: is just change the mindset that things are not secure by default, that you need to ask questions, that you need that labeling, you need to see if it 
if it has any kind of standards it's met or there's any transparency there. And if there's not, you have to ask questions. So every organization should be uh, making part of their acquisition process, um, pushing back on vendors and asking them how they've secured their software. So that was, uh, that was what I had today to present. I don't know if we have a few minutes for questions. I'd be happy to take a, take a few questions if there are any. Yes, we do actually uh, okay. have a few minutes for questions. We also have the Slido app that, uh, that has been receiving questions throughout your talk. It's now on okay. the screen. So um, before we start with these ones on the screen, are there any questions live from the floor from the audience here? Show of hands, no? Then we'll start with the ones on the app. Okay. So the first question is, any insight on the distribution of offensive capabilities among threat actors? Has the gap between the apex predators and the rest been closing? Um, I, as I said, I'm, I'm more of a vulnerability space guy. I don't follow the threat groups. Obviously, I know a little bit about it. But um, I would say that uh, just given the trend of everything becoming more and more automated in general and people being able to leverage cloud infrastructure and software written by other people that they can buy in, um, in uh, dark net you know, marketplaces, that uh, the trends that are allowing technological innovation are also allowing attackers to do that. And so, yeah, I think that the tools are filtering down and allowing... Um, the, the average attacker to have more capability. Uh, the second question here is you've mentioned the common association with uh, bigger brands with better security products. As a non-expert in security, is there a better way to shape procurement choices aside from stuff like Gartner? Um, yes, Gartner doesn't do anything for this, right? Um, they, they talk about features and functionality, but they don't talk um, if that product is going to be riddled with vulnerabilities. And there's, there's, there's very little out there um, as far as a consumer reports uh, independent labs. One of the things we're doing at Vericode is we have um, what we call our verified program where a vendor can send their software to us. We will test it. Excuse me. We will, we will uh, tell them where the vulnerabilities are. We will uh, retest it that they fix those and we'll generate a third-party report. So I, I think that uh, this is something that um, someone who's purchasing software can demand a third-party report from a company like Vericode or, or, or another uh, a pen, maybe a pen testing company. And, and so um, unfortunately, there's no standard here. Like Gartner's become a standard around features and functionality. Um, and uh, I, I think that standard needs to exist. But for today, you can, you can go to different independent providers uh, and get, get test results on, on, on a product. And, and we have many, many customers that do that with us. Um, and then the last question, uh, would you agree that the gap between what is distributed security and what remains vulnerable will stay the same relative to each other as time goes on? Um, I'm not sure how to answer that. I'm not sure if I understand the question. Let's see, it says, even if what is distributed improves over time and can have exponentially more impact. Um, I, I, guess, I guess I don't really know how to answer what the question is really getting at. I think that, um, I think that, you know, things won't stay the same because we're relying on technology um, to do um, more and more, more and more critical things. Um, you know, you know, ro robots are going to, you know, be be an AI are clearly going to be systems that are going to push us to become more secure. And I think the way to do, you know, the way I think to do it is to distribute security more more widely. Um, but I, you know, I don't think it's a given. I, I just think we need we need to try to do that. All right. Okay. So thank, thank you, you very, very much, much for uh, for hearing me.